so happy new year everyone and thank you for you know making it on new year's day the morning over here um, certainly you have exercised the strength last night uh, okay it's 7 o'clock uh, tyan why we are always begin on time uh, thank you for joining us here at the 3 thank you online audience for joining us if you're watching us on zoom or youtube uh, it's a pleasure to start session 369 Year 15 of Chayan Vat. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you all. Thanks to all of you who come and watch and ask us questions that we are able to uh, keep doing this. Um, <clears throat> so before we start, in case somebody is watching us for the first time or is here for the first time, Chayan Vat happens on the first Sunday of every month, usually at Pritvi Theatre. Some days when Pritvi has a theatre festival, we may be in Pritvi House here across the street. On the third Sunday, we are at Guparel College in Matunga, and if a month has a fifth Sunday, we are live from the lab in TIFR. Uh, it's an online-only session, and our sessions are also online on uh, Zoom and YouTube. In case you can't make it in person over here. Uh, now, uh, before I get to introducing Varun, who will be speaking today about the uh, this is the Nobel Prize uh, series going on. The next session, which is January fifteenth Sunday, is on the Physics Nobel Prize. Uh, that is related to quantum information and quantum computing, etc. That's at Uparel College and also online, and that's going to be given by Professor Vijay Rathavan, who is uh, sort of leading a quantum information or quantum measurement and control group at CIFR. Uh, he's also got uh, one probably the best quantum computer, small one, uh, though implementation in India. In India, and related to this, the January has a fifth Sunday. The fifth Sunday, we are going to be live from his lab, so you will be able to see this uh, development of the quantum computer uh, at the uh, IFR. We will be there from the quantum computing lab uh, live on the fifth Sunday. The first Sunday of February back here, or probably the fifth theater, is going to be on 75 years of the transistor, the one device that has completely revolutionized the, our world. That's going to be the next giant why coming up at this week. So the next one at Guparel is uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics 2022, uh, followed by a lab visit to the quantum computing lab, and then uh, 75 years of transistor. Okay, so that's what's coming up. Also, uh, next week in TIFR there are some fascinating public lectures. Monday night uh, is uh, the TNQ Cell Press lecture by Professor Ron Bale uh, on marvelous molecular motors. Uh, that requires registration. You need a QR. I mean, it's free, of course, but it requires you to register. Uh, just search for Ron Bale Public Lecture TIFR. That's Monday, January. Tuesday, January 10th, is another lecture, public lecture by Ali Yazdani, who's going to be talking about the secret life of the electron. Uh, that's happening on January 10th. So there are two public lectures coming up next week uh, at TIFR, which are again uh, should be on. On, I mean, should be on YouTube as well. Okay, so with that, it's time to uh, start with today's session, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Varun Suresh, uh, whom actually I know better because we've been partners in crime for quizzing. Both of us share a passion for quizzing, and we've been, uh, you know, partners in quizzes and things like that. Uh, but Varun is a biologist. Uh, he is from Mumbai. Uh, MSc SIES College, then joined TIFR for a PhD in neuroscience, um, and of course today he's not telling us directly about his work. Though some of these genes apparently are things that you also study, uh, but um, uh, Varun is going to tell us about the Nobel Prize last year, uh, which is something to do with our cousins and our DNA. So that, over to you. Now, if you're watching us online, please remember that the only way we can get your questions is via the chat. So please put your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we have. Uh, Uh, there's Mahima and other people around who are going to be monitoring the chat, and we have some volunteers to take them up. So please put your questions and comments in the chat. Also, I hope you can hear us. If you can't hear us, can't see things, etc., uh, we can do that. So Mahima, right now is a good time to try and share the screen and make sure the Zoom audience can uh, can see the screen. So I'm just going to check up if that's happening. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then you can carry on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so while You 
Okay, so we are we are live. We are live. Okay, thanks. We are live. All you. <clears throat> okay. Good morning, everybody, and happy new year once again. So it's really, really, really like exciting to see a bunch of people on Sunday morning, on New Year's Day, to come and like discuss about this year's 2022. Sorry, last year's uh, Nobel Prize uh, given to Professor Savante Pabo. Uh, actually, like I'll tell you a small story and why I wanted to do this session. When this prize was being announced, I was actually sitting in Israel for my lunch. I, back then, I was in Israel for at the Weizmann, and as soon as it was announced, I had my phone and I was like, I almost stood up, and my friends were like, "Whoa, what happened? You didn't win it, <laughs> clearly." But his work is not only amazing uh, that deserves a Nobel Prize; it is also very, very, very inspiring. It did inspire me. I will show you one slide of that at has how much later. But to understand his work, uh, we must first acknowledge, we must first acknowledge the people around his work. Of course, he himself first, uh, his group members, because biology is not. Although you get the prize, you give the prize to one person because he works on it for years. It is not a solo effort. It's an effort. If you check biology papers today, you rarely see one author, two author, three author. Most of the time, the number of authors in a paper. is in double digits and soon it may be in triple digits so i really acknowledge all his group members all this time some of his colleagues who i have mentioned hugo zerberg and uh, wilen hartner and there are many many more i couldn't put all of them but these are the two names because i'm seeing okay in all of today's presentations i also thank savantek to give uh, because he has given so many public talks that i didn't have to make many of these slides because he his slides are online and i can just take it and i thank him for his beautiful lectures whether it was at the japan prize or the ted talk or at the nobel lecture and i'll we'll put these links after the talk in the youtube so that you can also go and look at more detailed versions of these uh, discussions uh, the chai and white team uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity that's ullas arnab antara mahima and many many more who are around the world and let's begin so i want to begin by a quote uh, this is from the book sapiens Hundred thousand years ago, roughly, there were at least that we know of six human species on Earth. They were just on Earth, just like us, Homo sapiens sapiens. But today there is only one Homo sapiens. The question is, how is that there is only one, and are there some reasons to that? We'll ask why. That is the why part of if there is only one, and if because we know that there is only one species, what makes us special? So. next slide please uh, to do this we have to first make a large we have to make a large journey across many millennia and many many miles and this journey starts in africa why does it start in africa this is because it is thought and as evidence suggests that modern humans or even our ancestors first evolved in africa they made a journey across africa through the middle east into europe and asia and down, then all the way towards southeast asia australia and so on and so forth and this happened roughly 200 to 300000 years ago okay but this was not the only instance of such a migration a similar migration took place somewhere around 100000 years ago but now the species that was actually traversing across these continents were modern humans and when these modern humans actually now traverse they already met the previous ancestors one of them neanderthals in the europe in the european plate i would say and another hominid what is this other hominid we'll discuss in a few slides but when these people met like some 100000 years ago did they live together if yes how do we know that did they did they mix together these are some of the questions that we would like to answer and there is a ton of evidence that is now emerging to answer these questions next slide please okay so the first way we know that these populations lived many years ago in these places so on and so forth is by simple examination of archaeological evidence such that we know that some 80000 years ago these humans traveled from africa then they went into europe and as you can see in this slide that they are traversing over thousands and thousands of years across these places okay these are not happening in 50 years 100 years they are happening over tens of thousands of years and when such migrations actually happen 
I'll just take a break, let people settle. There is a chance that these populations meet each other, such that the Neanderthals meet each other, there are other Homo sapiens. We call this, we, we can question, did they interbreed? Did one, one species, that what we consider as one species, did they interbreed with another species? Does Homo sapiens and Neanderthal to that question? Wait, but how can we know that? We didn't go back in time to see if this happened. They are not around to tell us if this happened. There is no written record of these things happening. So how do we actually know this? That's the fascinating question. And most of these answers are in the DNA. As you all very well know, that most of most organisms have, that, have, that are multicellular or single cell have DNA as their main, in main uh, sorry, what could I say? Uh, DNA is the main component through which information is passed across generations. And the good part about this DNA is that it's not only stable, it is also helical and it's also complementary that it has two strands. In a way, that strand A, next slide please, when you open it and when you're replicating this DNA, the complementary strand can be synthesized based on information on one strand. Now, even if there is a ton of information on the DNA, it was the challenge of the last 50 years or so is to sequence this DNA. How do we know which basis or which part of DNA can be read as a book? It's as simple as if we're reading a book. So can we go to the next slide, please? All right. Suppose there are three organisms that have a string of DNA. If they are closely related, they will be mismatched in some of these ways. And this occurs because the, the process of copying DNA is not perfect. The errors are introduced in, in very little amount. But over time, these errors, errors accumulate and we can read them. This actually was very, very much given the Nobel Prize as well when, a pers when Professor Frederick Sanger actually introduced this method to sequence DNA, where we can read each and every base pair. Next slide, please. Yes, and back in, back in the 80s and seven, uh, uh, late 70s and 80s, it, this is how we would read. Uh, he's actually holding a big chart that reads this, and now you can, based on these times, you can read A, T, G, C, so on and so forth. But wait, the DNA is billions of bases long, at least for humans and other organisms. Sorry, you have a question? Okay, we will take that. So, this is the question for the question is, how do you know that these early ancestors also had the same ATGC quality? Okay. Uh, the question is, did ATGC, is ATG, how do we know that uh, early ancestors also had ATGC? I'll answer that question in two parts. The simple answer is, most living organisms have ATGC. Okay. That's the basics of it. There are exceptions, but we'll not go to that. Second, when we take their bones or whatever fragments of their fossils of many species, we find ATGC as in the DNA as the most important part, or as, as the most readable sequence. So there are only four bases that, that is most predominant in all species. That's how we know it. I hope that answers the question. Okay. So now what happens after this technology is developed is that multiple hundred of scientists come together over many, many years to improve this technology. We improve this technology in order to be able to take out DNA from very small amount of samples. I'm sure many of you have watched forensic sciences on popular television or popular science where they take out DNA from a strand of hair and so on and so forth. We can similarly do this with a small chunk of bone. And we have in, in one of the one of the labs that actually pioneered this technique of taking out small chunk DNA from small chunk of bone was Savante Pabos. In fact, you can see in the next slide, a researcher is sitting with a very small bone fragment that you cannot see. But the researcher is covered in all these PPE kits very regularly because they do not want to introduce their own DNA contamination into these samples. And now, after uh, like, sorry, I'm going to take a break. People can come in. Uh, can people slightly move ahead? Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, online audience. We're just making space for people to come in. Oh, you want me to be louder? Okay, thanks. I'll be louder.
or online audience just sorry just a couple of minutes we'll just do some settings okay so back we were discussing that doc, one of the loop uh, that samante pabo's group led the ability of us or led the ability of the scientific community to take out dna from small bone fragments that have been preserved for thousands of years without introducing contamination into them and that's one of the key things that uh, that is one of the key things of his work that is that he really took care of now when you take out small fragments of bones which have dna from a large which from a large time what happens is that we need to read the whole genome and this was a very 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 expensive very expensive undertaking uh, some 20 years ago it would almost cost 100000 to a million dollars or tens of million dollars to sequence the first human genome back in 2000 and as you can see as we go ahead by almost 2010 it is less than 10000 dollars and in 10 more years it's less than 1000 dollars per genome now this drives yeah you have a question yes a new technology was developed that new technology really drove the able yes the the question is more like this is okay first i'll explain that this is more in this graph this more moves law which says that the number of transistors on a uh, on a chip increases in so on so forth in time but it has to follow this pattern like okay it needs to be a straight line but when when really 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 uh, uh, revolutionizing technology comes ahead you see something like this we saw this in many things we saw this in haber's process on so forth uh, but we'll not go into that but what happened here was the invention of technology that can read dna sequences in a large or a high throughput manner that is something we use very 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 uh, like you uh, routinely nowadays in our labs but this ability to dna sequence billions of base pairs very accurately was the invention one other invention that actually made this that is before 2000 and that's also a nobel prize was pcr for the polymerase chain reaction something that everyone knows because of covid but that's how it is these technologies are revolutionizing to a large set of people and change our lives in ways we do not even understand until something comes up this one or this one yeah but yeah. it's yeah yeah yes it may be but we are looking at log scale because the uh, if we if you take the same graph and don't put log scale you just need a bigger graph but yeah but uh y axis is log y axis is log it's in tens of thousands like th uh, so now we are almost up to like 500 to 1000 dollars or something around that of a genome now imagine all of us can if we have 1000 dollars or like that's 90000 rupees you can actually get your whole genome sequence all right it, it has become that cheap now why does this drive dna sequence or why does this technology drive we will discuss with chai but to go to the next slide okay so how do we do this how is this whole process i'm going to explain it in very simple terms if we have two individuals i do, i don't think these two individuals need any introduction if you take if you find try to find how much of their dna is common you will find very little that is uncommon that is 0.1% difference between these two individuals and i can say the same thing about the individuals in this room and we are talking only about the autosomes not the x chromosome and the y chromosome those are those are differences of the sex, sexual chromosomes we're not talking about on an autosomal level the difference between any two individuals in this room is 0.1% and this is very small that means 99.9% .9 of our dna is similar we, when we compare it with our cousins who are now extinct neanderthals okay we'll find we have only 1% difference and if you even go back in evolutionary scale who can we compare it to great apes primates we find so roughly 1.5% to 3% of the dna and this is in the whole genome cross 6.9 billion bases now this difference is actually comes as a function of time such that if the difference between 1% roughly takes from 1000 years to 10000 years to come into the genome the difference of 1% takes 100000 years and the difference of 1.5 to 3% takes 1 million to 10 million years 
this is how in evolution if you see species the number of bases that are different is a proportion of time and this tech this is what we use to understand how are we related in the species and this is what dr pabo used and to figure out new things and one of the now let me introduce dr samanta pabo first of all not so you don't see scientists just in lab coats just in labs we are all normal people and here is samanta enjoying a nice swim or something like that and uh, to oh this is the tradition of course and after you whenever somebody wins a nobel prize they throw him in the pool oh and then they toss him a like a lifeboat uh -huh. okay cool i didn't know that okay fantastic so uh, let's uh, let's like a couple of facts that you can obviously find on the internet but it's important to know that he's 67 years old he was born in stockholm sweden one thing like i would like to emphasize that he takes his mother's name his father is not a pabo okay and he was raised by his mother and his his mother was a was a chemist and she is his inspiration to become a scientist uh he did his phd from the university of upasla he is also trained in medicine apparently and he did his post doctoral studies at university of zurich in california berkeley and then he comes back to upasla to teach medical genetics then becomes a professor at munich and then the german research uh, the whole german research community came together to build a max planck institute of anthropology where he serves as the director now that's about savanti pabo but you should ask me what is one of the most key discoveries that savanti pabo did that he got the nobel prize and the answer to that is a species called the denisovan now this discovery is only 10 to 12 years old this discovery was roughly made in 2010 what is the denisovan why should we care about it i'll tell you first of all all of dr savante pabo's work or all of evolutionary biology work also is helped by a fantastic team of archaeologists who actually go into these caves these deep dug holes across continent next slide please they excavate many things and this particular species was discovered in the denisova cave hence the name denisovan and how did they discover it? they didn't find a big skeleton or something what they actually was found was a simple bone that is of the ring finger i guess uh, or yeah and this is the size of the bone actually that is the smallest amount of material that they could really see distinguish as a different entity from all the archaeological excavation they were doing yes it is in siberia to be precise modern day siberia uh the name comes only because of that okay and i'll explain that this could be slightly confusing but it's a uh, this is an ode to the archaeologists who actually do the work because they are not recognized as much as the people who do the dna path but this is it uh, so what do we do with this dna can you go to the next slide please yep okay when you sequence this whole dna you can figure that this is a completely new species it's not like the neanderthal it's closely related but it is a different species than the neanderthal it is not modern day human so you cannot say it's it's you know it's contaminated by current day humans or any kind of humans who lived in the last 50000 to 100000 years and these denisovan have dna that could be very specific to current day population next slide please such that when i told you about the second migration of modern humans that happened from africa the second group that they met which i earlier said was the denisovan now interbreeding has happened not only possibly between the the humans and the neanderthals and the humans and the denisovan and why should it matter to you can you please go to the next slide why did this matter to you is because if you take current day population from very specific part of the world this is where the denisovan cave population near to the denisovan cave only 0.2% of the genome is actually denisovan genome in and around the cave where it was found even in eastern india and southern india you can find this number but look at the populations around papua new guinea or these are called the uh, uh, some set of islands it starts with an m i totally forgot the name uh, there up to 5% of the genome contain the denisovan sequences what does that mean that the denisovan that we found here were actually a population that spread all across 
Asia and Southeast Asia. And next slide, please. Now, when we DNA sequence all the people that are living today on Earth, we find that some part of our genome contain sequences that are from the bones that we found in the Neanderthal range in Eurasia, and some that contain both Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So, and these are in various proportions of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so we are in, talking about those terms. Now, you will ask me, okay, we in history it happens. Why does it matter to you sitting in this room today? Does this make any difference to our current day lives? The answer to that is a simple yes. And we will talk about three simple daily processes of our lives that these genomes do affect. And we are just touching the tip of the iceberg. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about it in three Bs. Okay, sorry for the alliteration. Breath. The first part is that these genomes actually help us fight off something, protect something, or make us a risk to something which involves breathing. The second one is birth. Please keep going. Uh, and the third one is brain. That is the fundamental question of what makes us human. And to do this, I'm going to cite a bunch of papers in which Savante is an author or the lead author or a, corresp or a corresponding author or a, just a, uh, uh, like or with many other groups. He made these discoveries. These groups made fundamental discoveries. And I'm going to tell you, uh, tell, like, tell about these. And we'll put these links of these papers in the YouTube link so that you can go back and refer. So let's start with the first one. Everyone here knows that we went through a pandemic. It's still running around our circles. I see many of you wearing a mask. Please continue doing that. Thank you for doing that. But we know that when this pandemic broke out, we first sequenced the viral genome. The viral genome is a few thousand to a few hundred thousand base pairs. But the human genome is a billion base pairs and more, six billion, seven billion, so on and so forth. We also sequenced the humans that were getting severely sick with COVID. The humans that were affected by COVID are and unfortunately passing away with COVID. We, and we try, we, like the scientists, when we say we, it's the scientific community, we were trying to ask, is there any correlation between a certain, certain genetic factor that is there in all of you that makes you susceptible or likely to you have, likely that you will have severe COVID? And the data is collected from all over the world. And they found one such genetic, genetic sequence that was highly predominant in species that have Neanderthal sequences. You can see, including in South Asia, it's very high, up to 25% to 35% of our population have this. In Europe, some, some 10 to 15. And exactly in the Denisovan part, also a lot of people having that gen part of the genome were susceptible to COVID. So can we go to the next slide? And what, this is on the chromosome three, and what it seems like is that this chromosome three comes into all of us for more modern day humans because of the interbreeding event that we possibly said could have happened. Next slide, please. And this particular chromosome three is very, is, uh, is, it contains a lot of genes. So it's not just that one gene affects our, affects our mortality or our ability to get severe COVID. It's a bunch of genes. And this is in people who were getting severely sick were more likely to have this gene than not. And when we check the mortality of many of the people with this gene, can you please go to the next slide? We found that if you had this COVID risk variant on chromosome three, the likelihood or the chance that you will die with COVID is double than the chance that, that you don't have. It. So this chromosome three is a risk factor for severe COVID and COVID related deaths. Next slide, please. Okay, but the question is, wait, wait, if this COVID Neanderthal gene is bad, why do we have it? The answer is not so simple because many of these Neanderthal sequences also helps us protect with other things such as HIV. We now we go to another chromosome, if that's chromosome 12, you can, and this is very well studied, even before we found the, the Neanderthal sequences, that if you have these three genes, OAS1, OAS2, OAS3, and if you have the Neanderthal variant to it, next slide, please, you will actually see that this Neanderthal gene helps you degrade RNA that comes from the HIV, double-stranded RNA, and protects you in a way that you have 
that you have 26% reduced chance of getting HIV. Now, this is very important. This is how many people are more susceptible or less susceptible to HIV. And this is a good part of the Neanderthal genome, as we think that we have inherited. Next slide, please. Okay, so when I talk about COVID and Neanderthal sequences, not everything is bad. In fact, there is, it's on the same chromosome 12 that Pavo and uh, Hugo Zerberg also found that these sequences that make people less susceptible to getting COVID, severe COVID and hospitalization in a way that, that, the, that the gene that we got from Neanderthals from various lineages helps us protect and reduces our risk. And, and this part of this part of the Neanderthal sequences were also found in high numbers in the in Asian population, South Asian and Eurasian population. Now, in total, if we check if a person who has the Neanderthal sequence, both on chromosome three and chromosome twelve, the F, uh, uh, like we see that if you have the chromosome three variant, you are hundred percent at risk of getting hospitalized. But if you have the chromosome twelve one, you have twenty three percent reduced chance of getting severe COVID. Overall, the risk is only 77%. That's only if you have both risk factors. Okay, most people have one risk factor or one word protective factor as an event of chance. Next one, please. But yes, we have a question. Please, let's take a few okay, let's take a few questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic observation. I didn't go through it, but I'll answer. What's the question? Yes, that is the that is the most logical assumption or the most logical answer that the population indigenous to Africa. Yes, sorry, sorry. The question, okay. The question is, whenever I showed you these graphs, I at least showed you two of them. That the Neanderthal sequences are there in the Americas, in Asia, in Europe, even in Southeast Asia. So why not in Africa? It's not that we don't have data from African modern present day humans living in Africa. It's just that they do not contain these sequences, which possibly suggests that the current population living in Africa did not meet the population that had the Neanderthal sequences or the Denisovan sequence. But yes. Uh, to an okay, the, the word pure, I do not like the word pure when we use such things. It's nothing is pure. The sequences were of modern day humans that were not mixed, yes. Uh, you see that these, these reds are not majority, right? So majority of the people living even there may not have Neanderthal sequences. But the, you will find all these sequences more in Asia and Europe than in Africa. But at least for these sequences, and this is not, these graphs are not total, okay? These graphs are for the sequences that we are speaking about on chromosome three, chromosome 12, so on. So they're very minuscule, but even in that we find that they are less predominant or negligible enough. Only for these, okay? We the that's why Samanthi Pabo's group and other groups are now continuously trying to work on how different or what are the differences the between the African population and the in the, uh, the other population. We must also remember that we have not. Uh, it's not known that how per uh, how pervasive is our efforts to sequence all of all of African people who are there. Some of them may have these sequences, some of them may not, but you have to contextualize, and that's the answer to that, that we need more work. But for these sequences, they are less predominant. Yes, so I'll repeat your question. The question is Sentinel Islands in Andaman and Nicobar, correct? Beautiful question. So the premise is that in, there is a set of islands in the Andaman and Nicobar called the Sentinel Islands. On these islands live a certain tribe, set of tribes that never mix with the outside world. If we, if we were to estimate, they are still back like 500 to 800 years or something like that. The Indian government has made sure over time that they are not disturbed because it's their right not to mix with other people and they, they live happily in their own tribe. The Indian government provides them with some kind of support, but very restricted access is to that. It would be very nice to find, there are many such tribes, by the way, around the world. It would be very nice of us to go and check for their genome, but that is a social anthropological experiment that needs to be done. It's a very good point. 
then then it would be very nice to check and it's it's possible because we don't need their blood if like we don't need to invasively go we just need some skin cells it's possible but this needs research funding directed towards that and right now we have to like think about these questions and actually direct the research towards that can, can somebody do a phone yeah 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 uh, there are okay so thanks you asked this and uh, it's i think it's very well known there is this group of companies or services called 23 and me and is that called 23 and me right that's called 23 and me right yeah so these guys uh, take you take your dna material sequence and if you ask them that how much is neanderthal and because all of this is public information all of these sequences are public information anyone with a computer technically should be able to do and an internet connection yeah okay okay uh, another question you're showing these uh, action timeline mm -hmm. Fantastic question. Is it completely based on carbon dating or fossil? Fantastic, right. fantastic set of questions. One, yes, all of these evidences are not single-handed, or they are not standing on one pillar or one chair, one foot of a chair. There are multiple levels of evidence. One is carbon dating. First, you first try and think how how old is the fossil. Let's say if a fossil is ten thousand years old and the second fossil is five thousand years old, it's a large difference, and you never found any other fossil with the second organism older than 5000 years old we the, the evidence suggests that the one that came 10000 years old is first and then you could also do it only based on dna without even the dna per, the person who's handling the dna sequencing understanding whether how old these fossils were because as a function of time okay let's take an example let's take two people have a kid then that kid has a kid with another person and so on and so forth you go uh, like you go in a fashion this way the person who is like the great 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 grandchild of the person at the start will have the most number of dna pair differences over time because the number of errors that you can introduce into dna is a function of how much the cells have reproduced so this is how we know this and i hope that answers that question we have a question here sorry i didn't Thanks. Oh no! These are not. These are independent events. Okay, we do not know the exact question. The question is: all the mutations first happened in Africa, then people left, and then no mutations happened or not. Yes. Yes. Okay. So first, uh, I will like try and simplify this. We let, although mutations correct. First, what we believe is that there is a set of ancestors who moved out of Africa. then they became different species over time in various parts of the world now at the same time when that is happening in europe and south asia there's also evolution happening inside africa itself that gives rise to modern humans now when these modern humans go out they meet the cousins so 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 as to say and that is all happening in over 30 300000 years so this process is continuous so they yes first they did mutate and blah blah and then they became new species in africa but at the same time neanderthals were also evolving same time denisovians were also evolving it's just that today we exist and they don't so it's a continuous process okay sir okay Okay, so you're digressing, but I'll answer your question because I'll, I'll, I'll first. Yes, first of all, the answer to your question. The question is: Is it all statistical, or is there a bias in sampling? To put very simply. or are there other factors okay the question is is this graph as a result of bias in sampling is it because there are other factors that we don't know okay first i'll answer your question point by point one that these are not restricted to any climate test you can see it goes all the way from north america above california and almost down to per argentina peru and so on and so forth so this is across latitude okay 
and if you take the longitudes as well like latitudes and longitudes so it's in europe it's in asia it's in south asia all right and this is this graph shows how much of the dna that we have all right so now it's as the, the normal assumption is that everyone gets covid everyone comes to the hospital there's different regimes of treatment in the hospital there are different environmental factors so on and so forth after negating all those factors is there a correlation that is statistically significant between having this gene and having a severe covid or not so severe covid however you want to say no i never said that i'm just saying yes okay okay great great question how do you factor all these facts in this first of all this experiment is done once the person is coming to the hospital okay when you talk about high risk folks so let's say all of us unfortunately get covid all of us end up in the hospital now we try and all of us get very sick okay we try and question how many is there a factor in the genome that makes us more susceptible to covid a factor okay we get all our genome sequence and then we find the correlation that uh, more than half of us have on chromosome x a particular sequence that is similar so the hypothesis then is that this factor is affecting then you go and look at the gene and then you see if those genes are actually expressed in your lungs so if you have a gene that is in your brain but not in your lungs then it doesn't make sense so they you negate that and then you find if this gene is on the cells that covid affects not all cells in the lungs are affected by covid and then you see if there is part in the immunity because most severe covid and deaths can happen because of cytokine storm so on and so forth then you go and look if this is even in the pathway and then you come to a conclusion or a logical assumption that this gene is actually affecting your life when you get covid okay we have a next question great thanks chintan oh there's no like the paper doesn't say that it's it's an it's it's the logical assumption that interbreeding happens we will take this question at with chai it requires a large answer okay but i i would and we will take this over chai okay because uh, it will break the flow of birth which is the next part and and that's one of the one of the clue is birth so think about it till we come back uh, i do not know of any such research but i will come back to it because the the answer to that is like if you are having non reproductive sex and until you go back in time and actually see it how am i supposed to know that? no uh, even if it says it has to be done in time not in a fossilized manner can we go to the yeah can we go to the next part okay so the next part is about birth uh there is a hormone called progesterone that is very important for the embryo to get attached into the ovum uh, sorry into the uterus of the mother and this hormone has works via receptor it's like this hand is a receptor this hand is a hormone so when the hormone hits the receptor this receptor catches and then things happen in a cell so can we go to the next slide what was found is that sorry there's a break up there okay so i'll just continue what was found is that this progesterone receptor is different between homo sapiens and neanderthals and some of the current modern humans have the progesterone receptor version that was found predominantly in the neanderthal and again if you check this very little in africa who pointed that out yeah, yeah. sorry yeah, very little in africa but very much so in the other parts of the world now this neanderthal variant was uh, associated with preterm birth what's a preterm birth when a child is born before the complete gestation period which is 9 months in humans if the child is born between 7 7 1/2 8 we call it a preterm birth now this was thought that if you had this neanderthal gene you get preterm birth and then the babies won't survive and if you have if this happens over a long period of time then the neanderthals wouldn't survive right can you go to the next slide please so 
what was amazing is that when these ancient genomes of 10000 years human modern day human was sequenced you find you find that this neanderthal sequence is there in many of them uh, this doesn't make sense right i'll tell you something which even doesn't make more sense next slide please that if you take current between now and something between 5000 and 10000 years old this preterm birth sequ the sequence that is associated with preterm birth is exploding so why is that the gene that is required for preterm birth is exploding over time next slide please it's because the modern allele which is of the allele that normal humans the modern humans have not normal humans is associated with miscarriages and this neanderthal vari, uh, neanderthal uh, variant although pushes towards preterm birth it prevents miscarriages so over time over time it seems that the neanderthal variant protects from miscarriage and but it's a risk for preterm birth now all this research is possible because of something called uh, the uk biobank it is not the only one it's one it's one of its kind that sequenced many hundreds and thousands of people in the uk and when researchers get the neanderthal sequence and the human they have they have the modern sequence you compare in the uk biobank you also have associated heart diseases like associated some other kind of diseases kidney diseases diabetes and then you start correlating these neanderthal variants and the modern day variants to find if these affects possibly then you hypothesize whether these affects and then you go and do the research and then you find it in people so next slide please okay the last part for the so today's talk is the most important part perhaps that every one of you will consider the brain the brain is what makes us human i would say one of the main key factors that makes us human and if you compare the brains of mammals across like uh, uh, evolutionary scales you see that the human brain is the biggest when it one of the biggest when it comes to equal to body size if there's a Afri if there's an african elephant or a blue whale of course its brain is much bigger than ours but you have to normalize it to the body size and in that way the hominid or the primate brain is very big and this is a graph that shows that so what happens is when a child is developing in the mother's womb the brain has something called stem cells okay neural stem cells these neural stem cells have to divide continuously to give a large um, amount of neural stem cells which then divide into neurons okay which then divide okay so for this part of the talk we will assume that these neural stem cells are black balls and the progeny that or the next cell that this neural stem cells give is one of them is the orange ball and the next slide and the lastly they give you rise to neurons which is the pink ball so for the next part i'm going to talk about black balls orange balls pink balls okay and this happens in all mammals with mouse to humans and so on and so forth what you are currently seeing is the one is the way this happens in a mouse such that one black ball will give rise to another black ball and another black ball in which you get two orange balls and finally four pink balls can you go to the next one okay in the primate brain or in the hominid brain these black ball also give rise to a green ball keep going please and these green balls give rise to not only one pink ball but also keep going another green ball the, the then this green ball keeps continuing to give rise to one green ball one pink ball one green ball one pink ball so at the end of two events what do you see that you have four pink balls in process 1 and five pink balls in process 2 and when you do this for over many divisions over billions of cells the difference will be quite significant okay so what an experiment one of the genes that found in these experiments that dr pabo was also also very much involved is that if you take this brain and put this gene called r gap 11b you can increase the size of the brain in mouse as well as in other monkeys and macaques can you go to the next one yeah this is in marmoset brain such that if you put cells r gap 11b in certain cells of one part of the brain you can see that this brain starts becoming bigger suggesting that bigger to have bigger brain you need this r gap 11b but what i didn't tell you that this r gap 11b is hominid specific gene it's a gene that is found only or in high levels only in human and not in mouse so this gene makes the brain much bigger for human can you go to the next slide okay so now you should ask us ask me hey 
this talk is not about mouse as a human, right? This talk is about Neanderthals. So what can you tell us about Neanderthals having big brains and humans having big brains? There is an answer to that. Can we go back to the schematic, please? We are talking again about black balls and green balls. Can you keep going? Can you keep going? Yes. So in the Neanderthals, one black ball giving one rise to one green ball, then the green ball continues to give you more, more and more pink balls. At, at the end of the day, it gives you four and one more. Okay. But the, this process can actually be affected by how much green balls you are producing. Correct. In the human, we have something slightly different that we get these green balls, but these green balls also give rise to more green balls. In the, pre in the Neanderthal one, it's a simplified version which shows that the green balls give rise to only pink ball and one green ball. This, in this process, the green ball also gave rise to another green ball, but not a pink ball. So at the end of the day, in the same number of divisions, starting with the same number of stem cells, you could have most roughly double the amount of neurons, which starting with the same amount of cells. And this was found in, next slide please, it was found in Neanderthals for one gene called TKTL1, which has one lysine residue, doesn't matter. It, it, that if you had, if you started with the same amount of cells, you can see the green ball number and the pink ball, it's in a scale. So you start with like some 10 cells or so on and so, you end up with 40 cells. And in the human, for the same process, you, you since you, because you had two green balls to start with, you end up with 60 or 70 or 80, 80 cells. And this is, this, law, this graph clearly indicates that. But wait, this doesn't happen throughout the brain. This happens only in one part of the brain, that is the front part, that is the prefrontal cortex, it's called. And that region is involved with intelligence, emotion, and so on and so forth. This is something that uh, we also try and study in our lab, that how this front part of the brain is different in mouse, humans, and so on and so forth. Can you go to the next slide? And this is a real example of how we try and correlate because we, we did not see a Neanderthal brain ever, but we know the genes that the Neanderthals have. We see their skulls, and this is a human skull. So although the Neanderthal brain may be slightly longer from, from starting from front to back, from the position of the skull in the front, it seems that the human skull is much more broader in the front as opposed to the Neanderthal. So it's hypothesized that the Neanderthal had a brain that is smaller in the front, but larger at the back, possibly, as opposed to modern day humans. And this is exactly what makes us possibly slightly advantageous in certain tasks of our daily lives, as opposed if the Neanderthal were here. Let me go to the last slide. And that is to conclude, like all the examples I've probably tried and tried and tell you that whatever Dr. Pabo and his colleagues have achieved over the last 30 or 50 years is exceptionally important for our lives as we know today, that this many of the traits that we have or we have, we show comes from various populations. And we are only touching the tip of the iceberg in terms of if in terms of how they affect our daily lives. Suppose if COVID wouldn't have happened, we really wouldn't know that the Neanderthal gene actually puts us at risk for normal SARS-CoV-1 because the COVID pandemic was SARS-CoV-2. The Neanderthal gene would possibly affect us in many other ways with respect to other diseases like SARS-CoV-1. Next slide, please. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, by Savante Pavo and his group, they really started the group, they really started this new field in science called paleogenomics. That you take a small fragment of bone that are like fossilized, that are millions of years old sometimes, and you can find out the exact DNA sequences that they contain and how they could affect modern day human lives. And the immediate effects was of his research was certainly uh, like found out during the pandemic, but now we are, the research is much more driven into finding out if they affect our lifestyle, if they affect our eating habits, if they affect our ability to work in cold, hot, and so on and so forth. And this will also affect our policies towards climate change at some point, I guess. And that would be the answer to that is that, like how would they affect is only through a collaborative effect of where we sequence more than 100,000 people across the world on like a yearly basis. That's called the 1,000 Genomes Project or the 10,000 Genomes Project. And this is also driven by a quest for personalized medicine. And some of you also in the audience might be like very much interested in these concepts because it may affect your lives more than we actually appreciate it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we will take more questions. We will take Chai. And we, I have a special...
couple of slides for the people who have come here uh, so that they'll talk about something painful. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, online audience, if you have questions, now is your time. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat and uh, we will take them. Uh, otherwise, since you have come here, of course, online audience, you do not get chat. Right? <laughs> Make your own chat. Uh, but you will get chat. I will say there. And uh, we can come back and there is something extra for everybody who come here. So, uh, unless there are any more questions, okay, here's one. Mm -hmm. uh, this is again regarding that temporal who came before whom. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that the difference in the DNA sequence tells us the temporal relationship between the species. Uh, do you mean expression of genes that way all the genes present in are present in all the cells? No, I do not mean that. So the question is, is this, uh, can, can you read the question again? Like it's very well worded. So I think I'll read it. Okay. So, uh, okay. Does, do I mean that the expression of genes that all, the way all genes are expressed in all cells? No, the answer is not that. Uh, the question is that of the genes that we are speaking about, are they expressed in all cells at all times? No, the answer is a complete no. Uh, the genes that were specifically like narrowed down in this process were narrowed down in a way that if you're talking about a progesterone receptor, you're looking at progesterone receptors that are generally expressed in the uterus or in the reproductive system, not a progesterone receptor that's there in the muscle cell or not. In that progesterone receptor in the muscle cells may have, may have different effects, so to speak. But with the research that is driven towards a certain process is always looked at cells that are affected in that process. I hope that answers. Okay, any okay, questions any here? Question. Yeah, the question here. Mm -hmm. The fantastic question. Okay. Uh, the question is the DNA that is there in all cells is the same, right? So how, how do we know that in the muscle versus this and that? Okay. So first, the, uh, we do not know exactly what happens in the Neanderthal. But let's assume a gene. Okay. I'll, I'll, talk, to, I'll talk about one of my favorite genes. It's called the SRY gene. It's exclusively present on the Y chromosome. And it, it's one of the key parts it's expressed in the test. Okay. So there might be roles of SRY gene in other tissues. But when we talk about the SRY gene, let's say compare between humans and Neanderthals, we look at this role in the test and when it is expressed. All right. Now, if you talk about genes, not all genes are expressed in all cells at all times. Okay. The beautiful, the, the, the reason why I study developmental biology or many people study developmental biology, because the beauty of our lives is that Let's say you have 100 genes, I have 100 genes. Okay, all of us have 100 genes. There are genes that are very specific to the brain at a very specific point of time. If the same gene comes up later in life, you may get diseases, you may get cancer. No. The, okay, the, that part of biology, is, I will explain, it's called, uh, what's, what's it called? The central dogma of molecular biology, which means So let's say a gene, let's say a gene like progesterone receptor, it may not be active in, in all parts of the menstrual cycle. It may be active only at certain parts of menstrual cycle where it's expecting that progesterone will be released from another system and it's ready. Okay. In the same way, insulin, let's talk about a very simple example, insulin. The cells that secrete insulin don't make insulin all the time or not in the same amount. When you eat food, there are signals that send to these cells that you need to make insulin now. So even only those cells will make insulin that are in the pancreas, not other cells in the muscle. They have the DNA to make, but they will not. This process is called transcription from DNA to RNA. We study this RNA because it's very easy to study. Then this RNA is made to protein. So when a certain part of the DNA is called upon, it creates the RNA. And this RNA is very different in your eyes than in your toes. That is exactly what makes your eyes your eyes and your toes your toes. So if, let's say, in a development, there are, if you take a gene, and in Drosophila, it's done and very well studied. If you take a gene that makes the leg 
and put it in the cells that make the antenna you can change the antenna into the leg okay but normally that gene is never expressed in the antenna or not on, at least not at that time so when genes are called upon and when they work is exactly why you are the way you are if you change this that's why you can have rithik roshan more growth one gene was started or not started that gives you extra finger that's why you have five okay so, uh we will take more questions i mean this is fascinating stuff i'm sure you have tons of questions uh let's do one thing uh let's end the online session before that let me remind the online audience uh our next session jan 15th is going to be on the physics nobel prize at cooperel college and online as well and following that jan 20 29 29 uh we will have a live the speaker to take a look and answer it if you're watching it uh, later uh, so on this note we're going to stop the online transmission thank you so much for watching this live on a new year's uh, day uh, and uh, first all those who are here let's take a break let's go down try is ready downstairs and then we can come up and uh, he has some more very interesting stuff to show you as well as we can take a lot of questions okay so uh, yeah thanks